It's my pleasure to be with you today as we come to worship God on this high and holy day to celebrate his goodness, not just this week, not just this month, but all year long. He's been keeping us. And so from your family and friends, your spiritual family and friends here in Atlanta, Georgia, we send all of our prayers and love to you there in Cape Town. Thank you, S-D-A-S-A, -A, uh, Staza, uh, for this great invitation to be with you. And as the Lord has been blessing and keeping his children throughout this year, I'm glad that you didn't let this pandemic stop your great conference and convocation as you come together to continue to equip yourselves for ministry in the years to come. Today, I'm grateful to be your speaker, and I'm trusting that as we get ready to go to God's word today, that you will lean in, tune your ears to the frequency of heaven to hear what God has to say. I'm excited about this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to our time in the word together. Now, as we turn to God's word, let's go to Judges, Judges chapter 16, the Old Testament book of Judges chapter 16, and I'll read in your hearing verses 18 through 22. Now, I'll be preaching and reading from the English Standard Version, but it's fine if you reach for any version that you have available. Judges chapter 16, verses 18 through 22, and here reads the word of the Lord. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees, and she called a man and had him shave off the seven lots of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But, verse 22 says, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. I want to preach from the title, Winning by Losing. Winning by Losing. Father, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. I was raised to be strong. In fact, in my home, I will never forget that when my parents divorced and split from each other, probably around the time that I was nine, I remember being told um, by my mother, now being a single mother, she says to her oldest son, you need to be strong. You are now the man of the house. And while I understand her intent of this statement, what she did not understand was the impact of that statement. For in reality, no nine going on 10 year old boy can carry the weight of being the man of the house. In a real sense, she was asking me, telling me, impressing upon me the importance to always be strong. What happens at that point is you begin to uh, give adult responsibilities to put a weight on someone that they cannot carry. And so throughout adolescence and into my teenage years and into young adulthood, I carried this pervasive idea that guided everything that I did, the decisions that I made, 
how I went through relationships to always be strong. I remember when I was, I had my first pastoral assignment just out of university and I was scheduled, I was actually stationed down there in Orlando, Florida. My wife's church at the time, we were not dating, we were not together, but we were friends. And I remember she came through the receiving line. That's where they come and shake the preacher's hand at the end of the service. And I remember she looked at me, she said, how are you today? I greeted her in that pastoral fashion. How are you today, sister? And she said, how are you? And I said, fine. And she stopped with people waiting behind her in the line and said, no, really, how are you? And, and I remember her looking past the facade, past the camouflage to be able to see that I wasn't doing as well as I said I was. And she said, you know what? Without me even saying a word, she said, you know what? People like you and I, people think we're always okay, but we're not always as strong as we seem to be. It is interesting that she was able to be so perceptive. That's one of the reasons why I made sure I married her because of her insight and, and her deep wisdom. She was able to look through the facade and see that we're not always as strong as we, as we present and demonstrate to other people. And it is here that we come to understand that strength is not something we can always possess. That strength is something that oftentimes is fleeting when we try to possess it within our own strength, within our, our own workings, to try to secure and then present and demonstrate as if we are strong all the time. It is insightful when we look at the life of Samson, Samson who is known as the Bible's strong man. It is Samson that is identified as the one who has superhuman strength beyond comprehension. If there were uh, some kind of comical or comic book uh, superhero in the Bible, it would be Samson for he is known for his feats of strength, known for the great things he's able to do with his might and his power. It is Samson that is known as the strong man. And when you read the account of Samson's life, you'll discover that Samson was told that he would set his people free. Samson was called to be the liberator of Israel. And yet when we find him here in Judges 16, Samson doesn't seem that strong. He is weak, literally at the knees of a woman named Delilah, a woman of the Philistines who he really should not be in relationship with, but because of moral weakness and because of his own desires overcoming his wisdom, here he now lies in Judges 16. He lays there weak at the knees of Delilah. It is here in this very familiar passage that I want to raise to your consciousness tonight that, that, that God has something to say to us about strength. Please don't miss this. Samson, Samson, this strong man, this man who, who displays superhuman strength, the Bible tells us that Samson now is with Delilah. She's trying to seek his source of his strength. And three times he's thrown her off of the scent. He's told her lies and she finally breaks him down and Samson gives in. And it is interesting when you read it. In fact, I would invite you to uh, look in your Bibles once again and read it because it is here that the Bible says that Delilah in verse 18 saw that he had told her all his heart. She sent and called the Lord of the Philistines. Finally, he gives in to Delilah's temptation. Tell me the source of your strength. But what I really want you to note tonight is further up in the passage where he tells her the source of his strength. For when we look at this, it will be instructive and insightful for us tonight. Look at verse 17. And he told her all his heart and said to her, 
a razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. One thing that we must note tonight is that in Samson's answer to her nagging purposeful question, he betrays an erroneous idea of, a, of strength and about where strength comes from. You see, Samson in his answer, hmm, don't miss it, tells her something. Samson believed that his strength came from what he did not do. Notice his answer again, right there in verse 17. He says, a razor has never touched my head, for I have been a Nazarite from my youth. He is giving credit to his strength. He gives the credit of his strength towards the Nazarite vow. He says, I've been a Nazarite from my youth. No alcohol, no touching of a dead body or carcass, no cutting of the hair. This is what makes up the Nazarite vow. And when one sees and reads the Nazarite vow, you come to understand that the Nazarite vow was really about separating yourself to be available to God. The vow was to symbolize a person's full availability to the purposes and will of God. This is why in the Nazarite vow, it says not to drink any wine and not to touch a dead carcass and not to touch one's hair. Uh, but, but understand that strength is not only defined by what you do not do. This is Samson's first problem. He says, Delilah, my strength comes from the fact that I have not cut my hair. And for many of us, who have been in the church for a long time, who have grown up in a religious setting, we define our strength, our ethical strength, our moral strength, our spiritual strength by what we do not do. Our strength is defined in religion far too often by the things we don't touch, by the things we don't say, by the places we don't Go by the activities we do not take, we do not participate in. It is here that our strength is defined by what we do not do. And like Samson, we make a terrible mistake defining our strength by the absence of certain activities. Ah, oh, you see, strength is defined not by what you say no to, but strength is really defined by what you say yes to. Because you can only say no if you have something greater to say yes to. Okay, let me slow down so that you understand what I'm saying. You see, Samson was defining his strength based on what he did not do. But as you can see, you can get tired of saying no if you don't have a greater yes. It is here in, in chapter 16, we find that his nose have run out. And now Samson is finally saying yes to a devious and demonic temptation that has been designed to steal his purpose and God's will in his life. And this is the same danger you and I face if we continue to define our relationship with God, to define our spiritual strength, to define our purpose and, and our identity in God by what we do not do. Let me say it again. You can only say no if you have something greater to say yes to. You can only say no to the enemy consistently if you are persistent in saying yes to God's will, which is greater. You can see this uh, in, in parenting. When a parent says no to a child, uh, it is oftentimes they say no if they're a good parent because what the child is asking for in the moment may not be good for them in the future. 
This is why it bothers me when I see parents giving in to their children in the grocery store or giving in to the child every time they want the iPad or the cell phone or the tablet. You know, you know what I'm talking about when the child continues to nag and you watch that parent say no uh, one time and no a second time and no a third time until the child in his persistence breaks them down and they give in. Now watch this. They give in to the child for something that they previously thought was not good for them, but because of the persistence of the desire of the child, they give in. And how is it that this happens? It is because at that moment, the parent forgets that the no in the now will make room for a better future. It is not that the parent is mean in saying no. It is not that the parent does not want to please their child. It's that the parent understands the goal of parenting is not to have a happy child in the moment. The goal is to have a healthy, responsible, independent adult in the future. We have to be able to say no, but we can only say no to temptation, no to things that are not God's will, no to those things that will uh, overthrow what God is trying to do in our lives. We can only say no if we have a greater yes. This has been the danger and the mistake of, of parents who have been rearing their children in the church. Those of us who are now adults were often raised in this paradigm. And you know what I'm talking about. When we were told no about so many things, but we were never equipped with the power to say yes to Jesus and his will. So we've, brought, we've been brought up in this religion of prohibition so that we are defined, even as Adventists, as being those who don't eat pork, who don't go to work on the Sabbath, who don't smoke, who don't drink, who don't do this. We don't go to the club. We don't go to the party to the point that people don't know who we are, what we do, what we stand for, what we are for, because we have been we have been raised and trained to say no, but we've never been equipped and encouraged to say yes. I wish I had somebody here tonight that understands that you can only consistently say no to the enemy if you have a greater persistent yes to the will of God. See what happens with Samson and what happens with us. The reason why you've got people who have been hanging in there with Jesus for so long and yet you hear of their moral fall. You hear of them taking a tragic turn down a dangerous road. You hear that they've made some terrible decisions that have derailed their dreams and have ostracized them to the side. It is because they've gone through what some psychologists call self-control fatigue. Uh, and this is what happens to Samson. His whole life, was about saying no to certain things. His whole life was about was centered on this vow and always saying no without ever saying yes is dangerous. You see, Samson believes that his strength comes from his obedience to the vow to not do certain things. That kind of religion makes you an imbalanced believer. Hear me, you can say no to smoking but can't say yes to patience, an imbalanced believer. Some of you, you can say no to adultery, but you can't say yes to kindness. That's an imbalanced believer. You can say no to drugs, but you can't say yes to self-control with your tongue, an imbalanced believer. In order to say no to the temptation, you have to have something greater to say yes to. Let me illustrate this. There's a place here in the United States, a donut, a donut place called Krispy Kreme, Krispy Kreme, very soft, very sugary donuts. And in fact, um, when the donuts are hot with the hot sugar glaze on them, there's a red flashing neon light that comes on. And if you're driving by and you see that light on, you'll start seeing cars pull in because the donuts are hot and Krispy Kreme donuts are best when they're hot. Well, one day I had a sweet tooth and I was on my way to 
a vegan shop that had a, a, a this really nice vegan coconut cream pie. And I love this coconut cream pie and it's vegan. So it's good for me, right? So I was on my way to go to the vegan store to get my coconut cream pie. But here's the thing, saints. Uh, at the intersection where you make a left to go to the vegan shop, guess what was on the right? You got it, the Krispy Kreme shop. And the devil would have it that as I'm at the light waiting for it to turn green so I can make my left to the vegan shop to get what was good for me, the red light on Krispy Kreme flashes on. And at that moment, I'm now at the crossroads, literally, of temptation. Do I make an easy right and go get what is not good for me, but what's right in front of me? Or do I wait a little while longer to make my left to go get what was good for me? And at that moment, I had to think, do I go right or do I go left? Now, the only way I didn't turn right to go get what was not good for me was because I had access to something that was better for me. I was able to say no to Krispy Kreme because I had the vegan shop just a left away. And do you not know that's how you consistently overcome temptation? It's not just by saying, uh, I'm not going to do it this time. It's not by just saying, saying, I'm stronger than this. In order to have the strength to consistently say no, you've got to be able to understand you've got a greater yes, because oftentimes the temptation is to give in to what is right in front of you rather than what God has for you. Let me say it this way, that it, the temptation is to give in to what's before you rather than waiting for what God has for you. Yeah, that's good. So that I was able to make that left because there was something greater. And do I have some people who are listening and watching this message to understand that you do have something greater to say yes to? You've got his will to say yes to. You've got joy to say yes to. You've got peace to say yes to. You've got unconditional love to say yes to. You've got a sense of destiny to say yes to. And whatever your Krispy Kreme is, no matter if it's a she or a he, no matter whether it's a job or some more money, no matter if it's the applause of people, the approval of fake friends, no matter what it is you're being tempted to give in to, please understand you've got something greater waiting on you. If Samson only knew that saying no at that moment, saying no to that temptation would have been able to give him such an amazing destiny. He thought that his strength was in what he did not do. And so it is interesting when you push it a little bit further, look back at the text. That's not all he says. First, he says, no razors touch my head. That's why I'm strong. In other words, I have kept the vow to not do certain things. That's why I'm strong. Samson was wrong. Watch the second thing. The second thing is that Samson says, if my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Wait, wait a minute, saints. Uh, let, me, let me read that again. He says, if my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Did you hear what Samson said? Lean into what he said. There's a problem with what he said. He said, my strength. <laughs> hey, Samson, <laughs> Samson, let's talk for a minute. You are like any other man. Samson, you, you, you said, I'll become weak and be like any other man. See, Samson actually thinks he is strong. This is why he uses the possessive pronoun. He says, my strength. But you must understand that Samson made a terrible and tragic mistake when he declared that it was my strength. Because there is something that you need to know tonight, which is the, the key to understanding the story of Samson and to understanding where strength really comes from. Understand this, 
Samson was never a strong man. I know from the very beginning, I told you that Samson is the picture of strength, that if there was a superhero in the Bible that would be one who would be known for his feats of might and power, it would be Samson. We learned it in our little Sabbath school classes. We grew up believing Samson was a strong man, but here's the truth. Read your Bible for yourself. Samson was never strong. In fact, when you read the entire story of Samson from before his birth all the way through to Judges 16, you will discover Samson was never strong. The Bible never mentions him as a strong man. Samson is not chosen for his strength. The Bible, ooh, here it is. The Bible has a qualifying phrase that is used to describe Samson's feat of strength. In fact, every time you see Samson doing something with supernatural strength, you will find this phrase. The spirit of the Lord came upon him. <laughs> oh, I hope you got that tonight. That every time you see Samson doing something supernatural, superhero strength, the phrase, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. It's mentioned three times in his narrative. When he killed the lion, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. When he killed 30 men of Ashkelon for tricking his wife in the bet, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. When he defeated a thousand men who attacked him, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Because whatever, whenever Samson was strong, it was never his strength. It was the strength of the Lord. Samson thought that it was him when it was really God. You must understand that your weakness can potentially compromise your strength if you believe you are strong. And I want to talk to some saints tonight who've been in the church for a while because the thing is, is that you can be so religious that you begin to think that your religion is your strength, that your doctrinal knowledge is your strength, that your understanding of the word is your strength, that your degree or your intellect is your strength, that your work ethic or your achievements in your job is your strength, or the money that you have, uh, uh, that you have been able to get through your employment is your strength. But what Samson didn't understand, what many of us still wrestle with today, is that we are never the source of our strength. If you believe you have it under control, if you believe you are not capable of doing that thing again, if you believe that you don't need any more help in that area, if you believe you've got it all figured out, if you are not humble enough to ask for help, elder, deacon, deaconess, yes, even pastor or administrator, then you are in danger of losing the strength God loaned to you. You and I don't have any strength. If you walk in your own strength, hear this, then you don't need God to be your strength. You cannot walk in your strength and God's strength at the same time. And so it is here that we find that Samson has now crossed a threshold. It is here that Samson has made the terrible mistake. It is a two-part mistake. Remember, he defines his strength by what he does not do, and he defines his strength as being his and not God. It is there that something happens. Do you see it in the text? That God's strength is lifted from him. Samson now becomes weak. He is not weak when he lies. He is not weak when he fornicates. Woo, you missed it. He is not weak when he does things God never tells him to do. Read the story and you'll understand it. Because watch it, watch it. God can handle most of our messes and mistakes. But there is some stuff that God will not abide with. And some things he will not permit. He can handle our lies. 
because Abraham lied twice about his wife and was still the father of the faithful. He can handle our drunkenness because Noah got pissy drunk and yet God still used him. He can handle our doubts because Moses doubted why God chose him, yet he still used him to liberate the children of God. He can handle our lust because David got Bathsheba pregnant and God still called him a man after God's own heart. God can handle betrayal because Judas betrayed Jesus and Jesus still offered him grace at the table. He can handle your denial because Peter denied Christ and still Peter ended up writing letters in, in, that are still in your Bible. He can handle your fornication because Samson slept around and still had God's strength. But there is one thing God cannot handle and one thing he will not stand. He will not let you take credit for his strength. He will not let you share or take his glory. When Samson said, my strength, God said, that's enough. He said, I've watched you fornicate. I've watched you sleep with a prostitute. I still didn't lift my, my grace. I still didn't lift my strength. But when you sat up there and told Delilah, my strength, he said, I'm going to take my strength back from you. And there Samson becomes weak. And the Bible says his hair was cut off. Now, Samson thinks it's because his hair is cut off that he loses his strength. But please understand that the hair was only a, an external symbol of an internal reality. In reality, he lost his strength long before his hair was cut. When he uttered the words, my strength, that's when God took back God's strength. And there Samson was led away in captivity. Now beholden to the very people he had power over because that's what the enemy will do to you. He will make you subservient to the things you were once strengthened to be over. Now you are under its control. And it is not because of the laundry list of sins we like to call out and focus on. It's when we step into the place of taking credit for God's strength. Now Samson, the winner, now becomes the loser. And I'm almost through, but I want to tell you that as Samson languishes in a prison, he loses his sight. The Bible says they pluck out his eyes because that's what happens. He lost his insight to where his strength came from. Thus, he Further, later on, inevitably loses his literal sight. There he is. Can't you see him? Grinding at the mill, walking around in a circle. They bring him one day when all of the VIPs of the Philistine leadership are gathered together in one place. They say, bring Samson for sport. Let us make fun of the one who was once over us. Now we are over him. They bring Samson in. And Samson, this now weak man, Samson, who was the winner, but now the loser is standing in that place. And it is here that Samson makes the best decision of his life. It is here that Samson does something you will note he has never done before. Samson utters a prayer. Will you notice? Go back and read the story of Samson and you'll realize that you really don't see a record of Sam Samson ever praying. It is here in this situation that Samson is now brought in the proverbial sense to his knees and he prays a prayer he's never prayed before. He says, Lord, give me strength. Huh. I love it. I love it. Lord, give me strength. For there are prayers, some prayers that God will say no to in your life. And you know what I'm talking about. You've asked God to do certain things and he said no. There are certain prayers God is going to say no to. There are certain things you want that God is going to say that's not good for you. There's certain things or people and relationships you want that God will say you're not ready for that. He'll say wait. 
There's certain things God will turn you down on, but can I tell you some good news? There is one prayer. There's a few prayers, and here's one of the prayers that if you ever pray it in whatever situation you're in, the word of God says it'll always, the answer will always be yes. Whenever you say, God, give me strength, hallelujah. Whenever you say, God, give me strength, he will give you strength. He can't resist that prayer. He can't stop but say yes. He can't help himself but give you the strength. Whenever his child, even in the midst of a mess you made for yourself, even if you walked away from him, disregarded his command and his instructions, you can at any moment say, God, give me strength to get out of this. And it is there that the Bible says, notice that the Bible says that even before, hallelujah, even before he went in to full captivity, that his hair began to grow back. <laughs> That, that, that the Bible says that his hair begins to grow back. Now, remember, the hair was just an external symbol of an internal reality, which means if his hair is growing back, that meant his strength was coming back. Samson's hair was not fully back. When the Bible says he prays for strength, he asks the servant girl, lead me. He asks the servant, lead me to the pillars, lead me to the pillars. I want to be able, I want to be able to just lean against the supporting pillars. And he prays the prayer, Lord, give me strength. The Bible says he begins to push and God answers his prayer, giving him supernatural strength again. Why? Because he humbled himself to recognize where his strength comes from. And the Bible says, you know the story, he pushes against the pillars and the place comes tumbling down. Now, that's usually the place where we celebrate, where we shout unto God, the fact that God gives us strength to push things down that once were over us. But as I leave you, I want to celebrate something that perhaps you might have missed in the passage. Remember, I told you that Samson's hair is just an external symbol of an internal reality. But you will notice that when he pushes against the pillars, his hair is not all the way back. Yet when he pushes with the strength God leaves in him, he is able to bring it down. Ah, oh, you're missing it. <laughs> Samson's hair was not fully grown back, but God heard his prayer because you don't have to have a lot of strength in order to have God come to your rescue. You might not have all your hair back, but you can call on him right where you are. You might not have all your joy back, but he'll hear you. You might not have all your peace back, but he'll hear you. You might not have all your faith back, but he will hear you. You don't have to be back where you were with God to win with God because he will hear you. And so with whatever you got left, call on the name of the Lord. You might say like Samson, I don't have much hope left but I'll call him with the hope I got left. I might not have much joy left, but I'm going to call him with the joy I got left. I might not have much peace left, but I'm going to call him with the peace I got left. And the Bible says Samson in that one day killed more than he had in his entire lifetime because God can turn around your mistakes and bring it for his glory. When Samson, when you and I realize our strength comes from God, there is nothing we cannot do. There is no mountain we cannot climb. There is no river we cannot cross. There is no situation we can't come through. It is. This is why when the angel told Samson's mother about who he would be, the Bible says that the angel said he will be a Nazarite from the day of his birth to the day he dies. And what that woman, what his mother didn't understand, it was a prophecy over his life. God saw from the beginning to the end and prophesied, he's going to start a Nazarite 
and he's going to end the Nazarite. And what happens in between will be covered by my grace. Isn't that good news for you? That God, before you were formed, he preordained and ordained your destiny. What happens in the middle is covered by his grace so that what he spoke over you shall be done if you just humble yourself and say yes. So I want to let you know today that God is able, that God is able. That God is able today, saints, to give you the strength that you need. All you have to do is trust him. To pray the prayer of Samson, I messed up. I made a mistake. I, I thought it was my strength. God, give me strength. And today, yes, today, he can give you the strength you need. You win by losing your strength so that God's strength can be made perfect in you. Father, give us your strength for when we are weak, you become strong. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.